Now we come to assertive. Assertive is showing a bold and confident personality in communication. Your walk, your body language, and words exude that you're very sure of yourself. That gets a negative connotation at times. Uh, it could be viewed as arrogant or full of yourself or whatever. That's just the way people are. I don't live my life like that, nor should any man live their life caring about other people perceive them because they're going to do it regardless. They have their own presuppositions anyway. So to touch on assertive, I'm going to go to Acts 2. Peter stands up. This is after the day of Pentecost. This is where he's going around, and this is after the Holy Spirit comes in a whirlwind of the disciples, and they are speaking in other languages. They're speaking in tongues, so they're speaking in other languages of and these foreigners can tell, like, they're speaking in our language. You know, we're from such and such and such. And then they think they're, some of them thinking they're drunk. Well, Paul stand, Peter stands up and says, Then Peter stepped forward with the 11 other apostles and shouted to the crowd, Listen carefully, all of you, fellow Jews and residents of Jerusalem, make no mistake about this. These people are not drunk, as some of you are assuming. Nine o'clock in the morning is much too early for that. No, what you see was predicted long ago by the prophet Joel. In the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions and your old men will dream dreams. In those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy and I will cause wonders in the heavens above and the signs on the earth below, blood and fire and clouds of smoke. The sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before that great and glorious day of the Lord arrives. But everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. People of Israel, listen. God publicly endorsed Jesus, the Nazarene, by doing powerful miracles, wonders, signs through him, as you well know. But God knew what would happen, and his prearranged plan was carried out when Jesus was betrayed. Now, you can, I can continue this on. It's a long narrative. Not to take away from the narrative, I'll go to... Another part of it, just to share his boldness, I'm going to go to 30, 37, where it says, Peter's words pierced their hearts, and they said to him and to the other apostles, Brothers, what should we do? Peter replied, Each of you must repent of your sins and turn to God and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. Then you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This promise is to you and to your children and even to the Gentiles. All who have been called by the Lord our God. Then Peter, Peter continued preaching for a long time, strongly urging all his listeners, save yourselves from this crooked generation. So he, he stands up bold. He stands his ground. He does what he's supposed to do, uh, being led by the Holy Spirit without a glimpse of uh, being scared or without hesitation. The next one I'm going to touch on is Acts 4. Twenty nine thirty one. And now, O Lord, hear their threats and give us, your servants, great boldness in preaching your word. Stretch out your hand with healing power. May mirac miraculous signs and wonders be done through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. After this prayer, the meeting place shook and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. That's what we're told to do. We're told to share the gospel, to evangelize, to stand for Christ in a boldness in a lack of being shaken situation this world's getting more and more satanic by the minute because of the liberal policies and all that but I'm not going to get into that right now but the more that happens the more you have to be bold for Christ because you can be any other religion but a Christian and there's no, there's no retribution for it you be a Christian it's like well you know you're this, that, and the other. So you got to get used to people calling you names. The next one is uh, Acts 6 and 7. This is Stephen. Stephen was chosen. He's one of the, the group that the apostles brought together uh, to, to evangelize and to share Christ with them instead of them uh, waiting tables in Acts 6. 
Stephen, a man full of God's grace, this is verse 8, and power performed amazing miracles and signs among the people. But one day, some men from the synagogue of freed slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him. They were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Sicilia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit which Stephen spoke. So they persuaded some men to lie about Stephen, saying, We heard him blaspheme Moses and even God. This roused the people, the elders, and the teachers of religious law. So they arrested Stephen and brought him before the high council. The lying witnesses said, This man is always speaking against the holy temple and against the law of Moses. We have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy the temple and change the customs of Moses handed down to us. At this point, everyone in the high council stared at Stephen because his face became as bright as an angel. So... People can say what they want to about you. When you know that God's given you confirmation, that you're driven by God, he's given you a confidence that nobody else can give you. You're not doing it for yourself. You're doing it knowing in humility that you couldn't do it without God. So you're using that boldness in a sense to glorify him with it, regardless of people want to accept it or not. So continue on. He goes into seven. Then the high priest asked Stephen, are these accusations true? This was Stephen's reply. And he goes through and he explains the history, basically, of the Jew uh, going all the way up from Abraham up to Christ. And then if you go all the way to verse 51. You stubborn people, you are heathen at heart and deaf to the truth. Must you... Forever resist the Holy Spirit? That's what your ancestors did, and so do you. Name one prophet your ancestors didn't persecute. They even killed the ones who predicted the coming of the righteous one, the Messiah whom you betrayed and murdered. You deliberately disobeyed God's law, even though you received it from the hands of angels. Then the Jewish leaders were infuriated by Stephen's accusation, and they shook their fists at him in rage. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, gazed steadily into heaven and saw the glory of God, and he saw Jesus standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. He told them, look, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing in the place of honor at God's right hand. And then they put their hands over their ears and began shouting. They rushed at him and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. He stood for Christ up to the point of being killed. That is the perfect example of boldness, especially when we're told to be bold for Christ. So there really ain't a better example than that unless you go to, I'm going to go to the, John 2, and this is Jesus. That's the best example. So I'm going to go to John 2. This is after he turned water into wine. He goes into the temple and clears it the first time. It was near, it says verse 13. It was nearly the time for the Jewish Passover celebration, so Jesus went to Jerusalem. In a temple area, he saw merchants selling cattle, sheep, and doves for sacrifices. He also saw dealers at tables exchanging foreign money. Jesus made a whip from some ropes and chased them all out of the temple. He drove out the sheep and cattle, scattered the money changers' coins over the floor, and turned over their tables. Then going over to the people who sold doves, he told them, Get these things out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Then his disciples remembered his, this prophecy from the scriptures. Passion for God's house will consume me. But the Jewish leaders demanded, what are you doing? If God gave you authority to do this, show us a miraculous sign to prove it. All right, Jesus replied, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. What? They exclaimed, it was taking 46 years to build this temple and you can, you can rebuild it in three days? But when Jesus said this temple, he meant his own body. After he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered he said this, and they believed both the scriptures and what Jesus had said. Because of the miraculous signs Jesus did in Jerusalem at the Passover celebration, many began to trust in him, but Jesus didn't trust them because he knew human nature. No one needed to tell him what mankind was really like. And I like to use that last verse for a lot of things about, like I have a hard time trusting people. And it's because of that reason, because if Jesus had a hard time committing himself to people and he knew what was in man, then what makes it so easy for me to give my trust to somebody else? And even if you make it easy for somebody to trust you, you shouldn't give your trust away that easy. Uh, it should be easy for people to trust you, but uh, you should definitely make it where they have to earn your trust. The next one I'm going to go to is similar to that. It's Mark eleven fifteen. 
And this is when he clears the temple out the second time. When they arrived back in Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple and began to drive out the people, buying and selling animals for sacrifices. He knocked over the tables of the money changers and the chairs of those selling doves. He stopped everyone from using the temple as a marketplace. He said to them, The scriptures declare, My temple will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have turned it into a den of thieves. When the leading priests and teachers of religious law heard what Jesus had done, they began planning how to kill him. But they were afraid of him because the people were so amazed at his teaching. He had to do it twice. He didn't care what nobody else thought of him. I mean, that tells you that like, when you're assertive, when you're bold, when you're confident, and you have so much surety in what you're doing, I mean, not to mention he's God. So obviously he's led to not hesitate and not to, in this case, establish dominance because it was a necessary thing. And that's why, again, I saw these correlate in some way because they are feeding the other one. Jesus is the ultimate man. He's the ideal man. And he had to display that in certain ways to display these qualities in certain ways. The next one I'm going to go to is John 1. And this is John the Baptist. I think John the Baptist is the most underrated person in the New Testament. He's just highly underrated based off what he did coming before Christ and setting up Christ's ministry for him as far as the foretelling. He was the last prophet to foretell Christ. So I'm going to go to verse 19. This was John's testimony when the Jewish leaders sent priests and temple assistants from Jerusalem to ask John, Who are you? He came right out and said, I am not the Messiah. Well, then who are you? They asked, Are you Elijah? He said, No. He replied, Are you the prophet? We are expecting no. Then who are you? We need to an answer for those who sent us. What do you have to say about yourself? John replied in the words of the prophet Isaiah, I am a voice shouting in the wilderness. Clear the way of the Lord's coming. Then the Pharisees who had been sent asked him, If you aren't the Messiah Elijah or a prophet, what right do you have to baptize? John told them, I baptize with water. But right here in the crowd is someone you do not recognize. Though his ministry follows mine, I'm not even worthy to be his slave and untie his straps of his sandals. Now, if you go back, I think 6 talks about, about more about John the Baptist than overall. God sent a man, John the Baptist, to tell about the light so that everyone might believe because of his testimony. John himself was not the light. He was simply a witness to tell about the light. The one who is the true light, who gives light to everyone, was coming into the world. He came into the very world he created, but the world didn't recognize him. He came to his own people, and even they rejected him. Just to stop there, they go to John again in John 3. Uh, and ask him after, you know, his, this is after Jesus is already talking to Nicodemus and sharing the, the new birth with Nicodemus. He goes up and they, uh, this is verse 22 in John 3. Then Jesus and his disciples left Jerusalem and went into Judean countryside. Jesus spent some time with them, there baptizing people. At this time, John the Baptist was baptizing at Antioch near Salim because there was plenty of water there and people kept coming to him for baptism. This was before John was thrown into prison. A debate broke out between John's disciples and a certain Jew over a ceremonial cleansing. So John's disciple came to him and said, Rabbi, the man you met on the other side of the Jordan River, the one you identified as the Messiah, is also baptizing people, and everybody else is going to him instead of coming to us. John replied, No one can receive anything unless God gives it from heaven. You yourselves know how plainly I told you I'm not the Messiah. I'm only here to prepare the way for him. See, he's willing to stand up. He doesn't want any credit. Like, that's... A, a different boldness. It's a boldness to stay in humility, not to take any credit and to stay in your lane and let the one he foretold of to have the, the, the credit of it all. And that's just, that speaks a lot on how John was. And, you know, John was in solitude for so long. He was out in the wilderness, but God used him so strongly. And I think it's one of the most underrated things about John is his time by himself. And he comes out out of nowhere tells the Messiah, does what he's supposed to do, like a boss. The next thing is, I'm going to go to Hebrews 
three, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go to Proverbs 28.1. This is a short one, but it just gives you the, the indication of being a Christian in a nutshell. The wicked run away when no one is chasing them, but the godly are as bold as lions. It's about standing up. It's about being there and standing for what you believe in. If you're a coward, you're not going to stand up for what you believe in because even Jesus spoke about saying, if you deny me, my, if you deny me for men, I'll deny you for my father. You got to stand up for him. You got to be able to be the the ideal man is going to be bold. The ideal man is going to be a Christian, whether people want to admit it or not. The next one I'm going to go to is Hebrews thirteen five and six. Don't love money. Be satisfied with what you have. For God has said, "I will never fail you. I will never abandon you." So we can say with confidence. The Lord is my helper, so I will not. I will have no fear. What can mere people do to me? When you have God behind you and you have that confident assertiveness, like people don't matter. Yeah, they can take your. They can take your. They can kill you, but they can't take your soul. They can't take your soul. Your soul is bound in heaven because you put your faith in Christ. The last one I'm going to touch on is James five nineteen through twenty. And this is about having confidence when somebody's in the wrong and you can save your brother. Basically, uh, warning strained believers. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. There's a high reward for that. Are you willing to look crazy in front of everybody else to help your brother? Ain't that what being assertive and bold and confident is all about? Think about it.